Even America is not ruled by its own government. It looks apparently, but the government itself is influenced by a very strong lobby. And this is the Zionist lobby. The Zionist lobby, I did some research on this, that, you know, they are the ones that, for example, when these campaigns, presidential elections take place, they are the ones that give a lot of funds towards that candidate that they know and they have agreed that he will do or he will work for their advantage, for their benefit. I did some research that, you know, how much do they actually spend? How much do they, even in England, British government, even in the British parliament, there are parliamentarians that are getting from Israel, one way or another, through Zionists, could be through, through organizations, but they are related Zionist organizations, they are getting some economic benefit. And these politicians are the ones that, for example, speak when Palestine is attacked, they speak in favor of Israel. Oh, Israel has the right to defend itself. What should, why do they do that? Because they are the ones that get financial advantage. They get paid from them in the forms of gifts, aids, etc. And I was doing some research. How much do they get paid? Can you imagine some of these politicians get per year, how much? Probably 35, 40,000 pounds. Some only got 15,000 pounds. Yet they strongly, you know, support the cause of the Zionists. It's not big money. It's really not big money when you think about it. It's, it's nothing compared to what we Ummah have in Khalij, in the Gulf country. It's, it's not even change. 40, 50,000. And he, this is the thing, you know, this is their planning. Where is our planning? We don't plan. We're not people of planning anymore. We are just, we spend the day and we don't even think about the next day. These people think about the next hundred years. They plan ahead. We Ummah don't think, you know, what is going to happen. They plan very well. And it doesn't take a lot of resources. We, the Ummah, has much more resources. The Arabian, the Arab countries, Gulf, Khalid, they have much more resources. And as I said last week, that all the oil that the Ummah is producing, black gold, the Ummah is producing, it's only using or it's only getting 5% of its advantage. The 95% goes to the Zionists goes to the Western powers. It goes against the Ummah, 95% of the, of the resources. 5% of it, of its oil economy, we, get the, we are beneficiaries. Not we, when I say we, it means Khalid, people in Khalid. The people that are born there, not that they are working there. Because if you're, if you're working there, you're not born there, you're not considered to be a Saudi, you're not considered to be a real you know, uh, Emirati. People that are born there. They get the benefit, but they only get 5%. And you know the irony is, they, with their 5%, think that they are the real beneficiaries because they drive Maserati seats, uh, these Ferraris, they drive all these, you know, uh, Rolls Royce cars. And because of the luxurious life, they build the tower, biggest tower, towers on earth, buildings on earth. They think that they are the real beneficiaries. The, re the reality is, they are not the real beneficiaries. They're only getting 5% of it, and yet they are happy with it. And they don't realize that the Prophet ﷺ, you know when he said, Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ was in, uh, in, in Uhud. Have you been in Uhud? Uhud is the place where the Sahaba were martyred during the Battle of Uhud, where Rasulullah ﷺ himself got, uh, got injured, and he fell down, and his, his clothes and his teeth fell out also. There, the Prophet ﷺ, after one year this, passed, uh, this happened, the Prophet ﷺ called the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ went with them to Uhud to do uh, Al-Fatiha, you know, just to make dua. He went there. While he was there and thousands of Sahaba are there, he asked to bring a member. He asked to be a member is the place where you stand up when you want to address and give the khutbah. Which means, the, sh the, the Sharheen of the Hadith, that they say among the Fawaid al Hadith is that the Prophet was, was addressing, speaking to a huge crowd. Otherwise, there was no need for a member. You know, if, if I'm speaking to 200-300 people, I need to sit on this chair. A member is higher than this. You need to, if you're speaking to a thousand people or more than that, then you would need to stand on a member. So the Prophet stood on the member, which meant there were a lot of people there. And you know, one of the things he said, and this is amazing, that he said something very, very, and he says everything is meaningful. 
لا شك في ذلك you know, in, the, in the أقوال وما ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى everything is, is meaningful but he said that إني لا أخاف عليكم أن تشركوا بعدي he said I am not afraid that you will commit shirk after me now, when he says you he does not address just the Sahaba he addresses the Ummah until the day of judgment يوم الساعة he says I am not afraid that you people my followers my Ummah will commit shirk after me no Shirk, that door has been closed. Because once you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you are affirming the Tawheed of Allah. And through the Risala of Muhammad, you are confirming his servanthood, that he is Abd. He is just Rasul and Nabi of Allah. You are, the, the doors of Shirk are closed there. So he said, I'm not afraid that you will commit Shirk. Walakin akhafu alaykum an tanafashu fiha. Walakin akhafu alaykum an tuhibbu dunya. But Imam Bukhari narrates, the Prophet said, I am afraid of one thing, and that is how you are going to be destroyed. And that is, after me, you will be indulged in the dunya so much that you will forget your duties and responsibilities as the Abd of Allah. And this is what is happening. We are so busy in, in, in our lives and in the dunya that we forget the, the Ummah, what is happening with the Ummah.